Good morning, folks. This is Todd Colburn of Cal Poly Pomona with your Aerospace Structure Series. This lecture is going to be the start of a two-part series on basic fracture mechanics analysis. We're going to learn some of the basics, the foundational concepts today, and then we'll uh, continue that in the next lecture to look at how we can grow our cracks and estimate the life of a part using this kind of approach. Okay, so let's see how it works. Now we've seen in the last few lectures how to evaluate the life of a part that is under cyclic loading using a fatigue approach. That approach used data, test data, uh, of a fully reversed, of a part subjected to fully reversed stress, and we came up with a set of curves that, ex that express how the fatigue strength or stress level relates to the number of cycles to failure. Now, fracture mechanics or damage tolerance uses a completely different approach. And what we do in a damage tolerance kind of analysis is we either measure uh, whether there are cracks in the part or defects, or we assume a crack level. We base that usually on how uh, on our inspection method, how what's the uh, smallest crack that we can see, and then we assume a crack of that size and then evaluate how that crack propagates through the part. When we're using a fracture mechanics approach, we're going to look at three different basic types of uh, crack growth. Mode one is what we call an opening crack. If you have an edge crack in a part, as you see in figure A here, and under tension load, if that crack opens, actually we call that an opening crack. If shear, uh, mode two is when we're shearing a sliding crack where we have a shear stress that slides the part along itself along that crack. Crack is like this and we see it sliding. And a mode three is called a tearing mode, and that's when we're ripping it like this. Now, fracture mechanics is done for all kinds, of, all these kinds of uh, modes, but the most common one, the one that's generally most critical and the one that's focused on mostly in aerospace is this opening crack that we're calling a mode one crack. Okay, so that is going to be the foundation or the focus of our study here in this little introduction to fracture mechanics. So the foundation for this approach that we're going to use was laid by Griffin in 1921. And basically what he did was he assumed an elliptic crack and in a semi-infinite plate. And he called the dimensions. Now this is not the whole dimension of the ellipse. This is the half dimension. So A is half the width and B is half the height of the thing, right? And he said, well, the stress is actually roughly whatever the far field stress is. We're back to this far field word. When we use this word far field stress, what we really mean is hey, we've got a semi-continuous structure, and what's the stress level if there was no problem, no cutout, right? Normally what we're doing is taking, like, let's say we have a part loaded with a force. We've got P over A as our gross stress. We could call it the gross stress, the average stress. And if there's no little cut or hole, that's also the net stress. But if there's a hole, then we have a net stress and the gross stress. Now, as this gets larger and larger let's say like the skin of an aircraft, where it's hard to define like what width of the skin is there because it goes beyond where I'm really focused, then that has the idea of a far field. The far field stress is just the P over the total A, whatever the stress level is uniformly through here. If somebody has a hole right here, we're going to expect a con stress concentration, but if we're using the far field stress, it's the stress as if there was no hole. Rather than normally when we're looking at stress concentration, we're going to take the net stress first and then apply the stress concentration factor. Far field stress has the idea that we're going to calculate the stress level as if there's no free feature, no interruption in the part. Okay, so we're using the far field stress, and with the, if you take the far field stress sigma, then this little equation here will give you the stress in the y direction, and we can see that that peak is going to happen just to the two edges. If the little ellipse is here, we're going to see it on both edges of that ellipse. 
this stress here. And it's a function of those A over B ratios. Now, if you think back and you say, okay, let's say we have a round hole, then that means A equals B. If A equals B, then actually your stress is just three times three times the far field stress. And if you look at what we did before, looking down here at the bottom, stress concentration factor, we found the same thing for uniaxial load. If you have a centrally applied hole in a rather thick part, then your worst case stress concentration factor is gonna be about three. So this kind of aligns. Now the next thing he did was Griffith postulated that crack growth is going to occur Rather than looking at the stress itself, when the energy release rate from the applied loading exceeds the rate of change needed for crack growth. Then he went on to postulate, okay, so that's when crack growth happens, but what we're really concerned about is not crack growth because we don't care if we have a crack growing. It's kind of like life, right? All of us are dying. Some of us are dying at different rates. We all are only here for a period of time. But normally that idea of dying doesn't trouble us unless we find out like we're gonna be dead next week. If our rate of dying increases in some unstable manner, that's where we get nervous. In the same way, since parts are people too, it's not the crack growing that's so much of a problem because as long as we can analyze how fast it's growing and we see, hey, well, Actually, we're going to be done with this part before that finishes breaking the part. So that's acceptable crack growth. What we're worried about is evaluating when does crack growth become unstable? When does it begin to happen so fast that failure is imminent? And so he says that unstable crack growth is going to occur when the rate of change of the energy from the applied loading exceeds the rate of change of the energy. A rate of energy required for crack growth. So that is what we're going to use. Now we're actually going to break this down, and make it a bit simpler, but that's the general idea behind it. Got it? So going back to his model, now let's switch from that pretty little smooth ellipse that we had and make it a little more jagged diamond shape part. Once again, our A is the half width. And if we wanted to calculate the stress at the tip of the crack, we can see that it's a function of our far field stress sigma. And we can see, so imagine that here's our little diamond shape. I'll just do it like this. Here's our little diamond shape. Right here, we're going to expect the maximum stress, right? If we had no feature, we'd expect to see the far field stress. If we have this cutout that's shaped like that, we're going to expect the maximum to be right there. Now, as we move further and further away from that tip, we're going to expect the stress to drop from this peak value to something closer and closer to the far field value. Eventually, you're going to get to the far field value because what we're going to see is the far field stress unless we get close, and then the stress is going to start climbing up. Got that? Now, the other thing you might think is, well, actually, if although it's a peak here, what's going to happen is that means all the stress lines that came like this are kind of tightening right through there. That's why it's so high. But out here, they didn't have to change much. So the far field stress still applied. But then as you move away, what's going to happen is the loading is going to come back and work its way back through. If you move far enough away, the loading will be uniform again. So not only will the stress change as a function of the width or radius away from here, but it also changes as a function of this dimension here. Now we could put in like an X and a Y coordinate of that, or we could put like an R, how far away from the feature, and a theta. So theta zero is along this line, theta 90 would be directly above it, and so on. So the way Griffith postulated is here, or the, where this work has been extended, is we're going to put in an R and a theta to locate how where we are. And we can see if we take the far field stress, we can just use a, some function of this R and theta to calculate what the stress is at those points. That's what these three equations do. It's going to give us the stress in the x, y, and the shear stress as a function of what the far field stress is, what the radius is, and what that angle is. And this is all developed straight from trig. Okay? You got that? Now, we're going to take that a little further then. If we define our stress intensity, so here's a new parameter we're going to find called the stress intensity factor. Okay, 
The stress intensity factor we're going to define, K1, is now this looks like Ki, and I'm a little sloppy in my terminology I, because stress intensity, right, starts with I. I often say K sub I, but actually it's not K sub I. What it is is K sub 1. It is the stress intensity, yes, but what the little one is drawing our attention to is the fact that this is a mode one crack. Remember, we're only going to be doing mode one crack, but when you say key K1, you're seeing that that's a mode one crack or an opening crack. We're defining that mod factor is the far field stress sigma times the square root of pi A. Now, this is kind of a weird unit, which is going to give us kind of strange units. This means we're going to have units for stress intensity of PSI square root of inches. If that's not a weird unit, I don't know what is, but that's what unit we're going to use. So the far field stress times the square root of pi a. Got that? Okay. Now you got to be warned here. Some folks use this equation like that for stress intensity. We're going to tweak it in a moment because this doesn't have quite enough information and use a different form than this. But if we start with this and this, we define our stress intensity this way. And then we substitute this equation back into our original three equations. Then we can rewrite the equations as shown over here to the right where we now have our stress in the x, y, and the shear stress as a function of our stress intensity. Okay, we're getting closer to what we're going to do. Now, the stress intensity factor is a function of geometry, size, and shape of the crack and type of loading. But if you think about that statement that I just made and you look at this equation, it doesn't look like we have a whole lot of, of this information. This statement says it's a function of geometry, size, shape of the crack rope, and type of loading. However, if you look at this equation, all it's a function of is what the far field stress is and what that crack length is. Now, here's another place to be warned. We're calling the crack length A, but if you look at our picture, that's not the crack length at all. The crack length is really 2A, but what we're defining is we're defining the crack length parameter as A, which in this case is one half of the crack size or width. So this is another thing you're going to have to be alert for when you're doing damage tolerance. When we talk about the what's the crack size, right, if we spot a crack, we're talking about what the actual length of the crack is. But if we say what is the crack length, A, it's a function of what type of crack we have. And often that A is the whole crack length, and often it is actually only half of the crack length. And that depends on how that crack is defined and how it meets our parameters. We're going to find out more about that in a minute, but you need to be alert to that already. Okay. So we see that the stress intensity K sub one is the stress level and the square root of pi A, where A is the crack parameter, often the crack length, but sometimes it's half the crack length. Now we're actually going to find out because this doesn't tell us enough, all this has is, is the crack size and the stress level. We're going to introduce another parameter, beta, to introduce more information about the loading, the geometry, and that kind of thing. Let's take a look at how that works on the next slide. For example, let's say that we have a central crack, a through crack in a part. Let's say I have a thin plate and this plate has a crack in the middle of it. The loading is going axially, but the crack dimension, or the width of the crack, goes perpendicular to that crack. And this crack is located right in the middle. We're actually going to use a slightly modified uh, form of our stress intensity equation. Our K sub 1 is going to be beta. We're going to use beta to be a parameter. We're going to call it the stress intensity modification factor. That beta is going to accommodate the idea that this is a central crack. So we're going to use this other form, K1 equals beta max stress square root of pi A. Now if we have a central crack, as we see here, we have a part of a certain width and a certain thickness with a uniform stress on it, axial stress. We're going to set our crack dimension or our crack parameter 
is going to actually be one half of the crack length. So A is actually one half of the crack length. You can see that because it's written as 2A here. So we've got a stress level, we've got this crack length 2A, and we're going to calculate beta. We can use it, we, we can either read it off this curve. So this means if we're reading this curve, we would see for a value of 0.2, A over B ratio 0.2, it looks like our crack is going to be about a 1.1, .1, or beta is 1.1. If we have a crack uh, A over B ratio of 0.3, that looks like our crack length is, or our beta is 1.3. A crack length uh, A over B ratio of 0.4, sets we have a beta of 1.8 and if we have a a over b ratio of 0.45 it looks like we are at 2.6 is our beta so we plug in our beta here we take our maximum stress pi and that crack parameter a which in this case is one half of the crack actual length where the crack length goes from there to there and our A parameter is half of that value. Now, if we uh, actually are between points, we can use this equation to, uh, uh, to get a more accurate estimate of our, of our beta, of our stress intensity modification factor. The stress intensity modification factor is introducing some basic loading and geometry information. Now, some folks and some references will take this beta parameter and break it up into two parameters and give two different ways of calculating the two subparameters that give you a total of beta. But for our purposes, this is a general enough approach that is used by enough folks to give us a, a reasonable foundation. Okay? So, once again, if we want to estimate the stress intensity for our part, we're going to start by figuring out what is the maximum stress on the part, what is the uh, what kind of crack do we have, if it happens to be a centrally uh, located through thickness crack like this one, we will take the total length divided by 2 and that will be our A parameter. We will then look on this, we'll calculate the A over B ratio where B is the width of the part and we will uh, calculate our A over B ratio, and then we will estimate our beta. Now let's say that we have a, so how many parts look like this thin plate? Well, maybe not a whole lot of air, air, aerospace parts look like this. But if we're talking about a skin, a lot of times we can say, well, let's say we have a row of a bunch of fasteners in a part, and we have a far field stress sigma that's a maximum stress of some value, a lot of times we can say, well, we will just take this, we will pretend that our part is this wide, we'll call that B, from the edge of this hole to the edge of this hole, with this centrally applied hole, this is 2A, we'll set this to our B value, so if this spacing is S from center to center, it looks like we've got 2S minus D is our, uh, is our total width of this part, and we can uh, use this curve in this manner. On the other hand, let's say we have an angle, and let's say that this angle has a edge crack like this. If that were the case, or excuse me, this is not an edge crack, uh, oh, let's do a different one. Or, for example, if we have, let's say, a hat stringer, and let's say that this is an isometric one, and it goes like this, and somewhere along the thing we see, let me draw it differently, let's say it looks like this. This will be easier to see. This is a symmetric part, and it's going like this. And let's say there's maybe a bunch of holes, and so we get a, a crack, running right here, and its dimension is 2a. Well, we can actually fold this part out. We can take this dimension from here to the half length. We'll call that uh, 
plus from half length to half length B2 plus half length to half length B3 plus half length to half length B4 plus half length to the edge B5. Sum up that B1 plus B2 plus B3 plus B3 4 plus B5. That is the total B of the part that this crack is centrally located. We can figure out what that half crack length parameter is. Calculate our A over B ratio and we're back in business. That's how we can estimate or solve those kinds of problems. Okay, so uh, with that said, let's say we have instead, we get two edge cracks, edge cracks that are symmetric on the part. If that's the case, once again, now our, our crack parameter A is going to actually be the crack length. And so we're going to take that A and plug it into our equation. We're going to calculate our A over B ratio. We're going to uh, find it on this curve and read our beta. Now to get a more accurate level, as you should in this class, we can use this equation here to give a nice precise value of what that is. If we have that same part, that hat stringer we were talking about before, and let's say that uh, that part experiences, we find an edge crack that's located here, and we have another one on the other side that's located over there, we can use this uh, same method. We, once again, looking at things, we've got a crack over on this side and a crack on the other side in the same location. We'll take that crack length. We'll calculate that same folded out B value, effective width of the part, and we can plug in those values to get our A over B ratio, which we place here with our max stress and our A parameter to get our stress intensity, K1. Got it? Okay, how about if we have a different part? Let's say we have something that looks like this. We have a single edge crack, for example. Um, let's say we have a part like this. For example, let's say we have an angle. And let's say this angle has, we have discovered an edge crack on the angle that's sitting right in there. Okay? That edge crack, we look at this and we say, well, that's our A dimension. Great. And we can say, okay, this angle from here to the half width, we'll call that B1. From half width to the end, we'll call that B2. So the B for this part looks like B is our dimension. B equals B1 plus B2. Notice that's going to the half thickness, not to the edge of the part. That's going to be our B. What's our A? It's right here. So our A over B ratio, we calculate that, we enter this, and we just read the curve for our beta. Or better yet, plug into this equation to calculate the beta. We plug in our beta here, max stress there, our A parameter there, we calculate our K1. That's for an edge crack. Or if we had that hat stringer, but we only had that crack on one of the two edges. Okay. If we have now, you'll notice this looks quite similar. We have an edge crack again, but the loading is different. Now what we have is bending on the part. For example, parts that might be like this would be if we have a, let's say we have a, a thin part like this with a bending moment that goes like this with a edge crack on the side that's getting tension. Or if we have, let's say, a, uh, how about a Z stringer? And let's say that this Z stringer has a crack right here, and we see that we're getting bending maybe about uh, this axis, going like this, a bending moment like this. That's going to introduce that kind of bending. It's pulling tension on this side and compression on this side. Now this is not precisely the same because you'll see that stress is zero all through here. 
But if you fold that out from here to here is B1, from here to here is B2, from the middle of the thickness to there is B3. So B is the summation of those little B segments. Take our A dimension, A over B ratio here, and we can read our beta and plug in our values. Got that? That's how that works. Here's another one. This is a little trickier. In this case, we have a hole. Now we have a lot of holes in aerospace, and a lot of times we start the cracks from there. We, uh, so if we get a condition like this, we're going to look and say, okay, what is our A over B ratio? First, we'll take the distance from edge to edge, and we'll call that 2A. So A is half of that value. Okay. Then we're going to go and calculate our A over B ratio. Great. Then we're going to select the curve our R over B ratio. So if the radius of the hole is zero, if there's no hole, just a central crack, that should be very similar to our earlier curve, and that would be this curve down here. Now if, if our R, if our, radi if our hole radius is uh, one quarter uh, of, our, of our B dimension, then that means we've got this curve here, and we would read that curve for our beta. If that is uh, equal to 0.5, then we can read this for our beta. In my handbook, I give you curves or equations for these curves, which you can use to give a more precise number. Otherwise, we would just read the curve for the values, plug in the A, plug in the beta and the alpha. Now, I don't give you a condition like this in the handbook. Um, and there are actually curves for this, but I don't give you one. So if in arrow 3261 we get a hole with a single-sided crack, we will approximate this as being 2A and use this curve. That's not strictly correct, but we can do it for our practice introductory stuff. If you're out there in industry and you get one that's shaped like this, then you're going to want to go and find an appropriate curve or use NASCRO or AFCRO, which has a database of values. Okay. Okay. So we have seen that our stress intensity can be written this way, where K1, with that one drawing attention to the idea that it's a mode one uh, crack, is going to just be your beta, which is for a certain crack size, the stress, square root of pi A. Once again, now we often think of A as the crack length. It's actually better to think of A as the crack parameter because as we saw before, A is sometimes the actual crack length, sometimes it is half or often it is half the crack length and sometimes it's totally something totally different like with holes, where it's that whole length from end to end, one half of that whole length from crack to crack tip with often a hole part way in between. So with that in mind, our K1 can be written as the crack parameter A times pi square root of that quantity times the stress times the beta that's associated with the crack parameter, which means we look up the crack parameter, we figure out the crack parameter, we figure out the ratio or whatever we're going to need, which plot we're going to use for our beta, and we calculate beta for that crack parameter that we place here. We're using the maximum stress in this equation, and the stress that we're using is the gross stress, which means it's the force over the cross-sectional area. Or it might even be a bending stress, MC over I, but we have not modified the area to remove any the area of any holes or the crack itself or anything else. This is in contrast to what we do with static strength, where we're usually starting with the net area for our stress, and what we do with uh, fatigue, where we're using that net area, and even what we're going to do in a few minutes, looking for residual strength, where we use the net area. This equation needs the far field stress which I like to call the gross stress because basically it's the stress with, on the gross area, the total area of the part without the features, any cutouts or cracks removed. That's how we calculate K1 that's associated with that crack parameter. Okay? All right, with that said,
um, we compare this crack, this uh, stress intensity, to the K1C for the material. Now, K1C is the critical uh, stress intensity factor for the material. Each material, uh, and this, this can vary for, for like aluminums, can have a wide range of critical stress intensities depending on temper and other things, alloying elements. But basically what this is, K1C is the critical value of this K1. What that means is if your K1 is below this value, your crack may grow, but you won't have fast fracture, sudden uh, failure of the part. If once your K1 surpasses K1C, you now are likely to experience a fast fracture of the part. This is called the critical stress intensity. It's also called the fracture toughness. And we talked about that before where that fracture toughness was the area under the stress strain curve, roughly. So uh, K1C is the critical stress intensity factor. And what we can do now is write our, mar as we're going to show you in a minute, we can write our margin of safety of the critical stress intensity uh, against the stress intensity that we currently have at the current crank parameter and the max stress. In order to do this check, we're going to need values for K1C. These are some typical values out of Shigley. And uh, these are just rough approximations of these values for some gross materials like carbon steels, low alloy steels, high alloy steels, and so on. Now, I'm about to give you some better numbers out of the AFTRO program, but these values here, they're too, uh, too approximate. There's a lot of variance between each of these categories, but they're good for practice, and I use these for some of the problems in our classes at Cal Poly Pomona. So this is the first place that students will go when they're looking for the critical stress uh, intensity for their material. Industry professionals, I'm going to encourage you to go to the next chart, which I'm going to give you in a moment. For, uh, But let's just bring uh, the idea here that we now have values of K1C, and we can go on to evaluating the stress intensity against the critical value. Before we do that, I want to introduce two other parameters, C and M. Now, we haven't covered yet what we're going to do with these, but these are going to help us to characterize the crack growth behavior. We will learn about that in lecture eight when we finish our fracture mechanics lecture. So for are your purposes today, you need to be able to understand how to calculate K1, the stress intensity, and how to find K1C, the critical stress intensity, and also to get the constant C and M, which we will learn how to use next lecture. You got that? With that said, let's imagine that we have evaluated the correct parameter that we find on a part and the corresponding maximum stress and the corresponding beta for that crack parameter. We calculate our K1, we find the K1C here, and now we want to evaluate a margin of safety against fast fracture. That can be done with our standard margin of safety equation, which is just K1C divided by K1 equals zero. As with other kinds of margins of safety of this kind, a margin of safety of zero means you're okay, a margin of safety uh, negative margin of safety means you have fast fracture, okay? This is the first check we should make with damage tolerances to find out for the current crack parameter, are we gonna fast fracture? If we are, we need to fix the material, fix the part, or redesign. If this margin of safety is positive, it means we have more work to do as we evaluate the crack growth through the part to find out if it's gonna result in a, an, uh, an acceptable life. Now that we understand how to use evaluate K1 against K1C, let's go ahead and look at some additional values for K1C that are more accurate that could be used for industry work. This table here has some values from the AFGRO program, which is one of the commercially available crack growth softwares that are out there. What this shows is for various materials, we see the same information as on the last table, K1C, C, and M. Since these values are a little more precise, these could be used by industry professionals, although uh, industry professionals should really go 
if you don't find your material here, you ought to go look at the industry sources, AFCRO, or other documented sources to get these numbers. Uh, we see K1C, we see C, and we see M. You can see by just looking at aluminum, there's actually quite a lot of variance in the K1C for these different uh, grades of material, while in the last table, we just kind of lumped them all together and said it was 23 squared inches KSI. Uh, so there's quite a lot of variance depending on alloying alley, uh, elements, alloying elements, heat treat, and things like this. So how are we going to use these values? Well, if you're an industry, you can use these values if you find your material or go to other industry sources. If you're a student in Aero 3271 in Cal Poly Pomona, because I have created homeworks based on the other table, what you're going to do is look at the problem, and, uh, and what you're going to do is come here and see if your material is listed precisely. For example, 2024 T3 aluminum clad sheet is listed in this table. This is where you'll get values. 7075 T6 aluminum sheet is here, so you'll get the values here. But if, you, if the problem just says aluminum, then use the, the values from the other table, because those are how I develop some of these problems, and that will keep you uh, on track so you can match the answers. So our approach will be to look here first. If it's not listed here, do our best to categorize it in one of the categories of table one, and then use those. All right. So, if we want to evaluate fast fracture of the part, what we're going to do first is determine the K1C for the material by going to our table, 431, in our handbook. Okay? We then need to determine what our initial crack size is. Either that's given to us in the problem statement, or it's going to be a function of how closely we're looking, or we're going to assume a crack size based on what we can see. Okay? We then are going to calculate the initial beta. Remember, beta is a function of geometry of the material, but also of a stress level. So we're going to go and calculate what our beta is. Okay. We then calculate our maximum stress. Remember the far field stress, the value we're going to use is the maximum stress. Now, <clears throat> when we're doing, doing this analysis, we're going to use two parameters here. We're often going to use the max stress. Whenever we go to the stress intensity equation, we're going to be using the max stress for that. Later, we'll find that the change in stress will be valid. We'll be using that later. Don't get confused. Right now, we're focused on the maximum stress. Okay, So we calculate the max stress at the crack tip. Uh, and then what we're going to do is calculate our K1 for the part using this equation. This means we're going to have to go and use the initial beta, the max stress, and the crack length at that stress level. You see that? Now, once we have this, that's the, that's the K1 for that stress level and crack size. Okay. Now we can evaluate fast fracture. Does the part fail at that stress level? If it does, we have to redesign the part. If it doesn't, we can continue to analyze the crack growth. Okay. And we can write our margin of safety for fast fracture. This is of how we evaluate fast fracture. Now, once again, if this margin is positive, we're going to go on to calculate how that part responds under repeated loading. However, we're going to look at that next lecture rather than this lecture. Right now, we're going to stop at just evaluating fast fracture and a couple other related items. So we're going to uh, look at a couple ways of figuring out. So we just validated what fa that fast fracture either did or did not happen for the current stress level and the current crack size. True? Okay. Now what we're going to do is fa figure out, okay, well, if our crack grows, what's the final crack growth at which fast fracture will happen for that stress level? Now remember, with fracture mechanics, we're not calculating, we're calculating a stress intensity, but we're not calculating a stress uh, concentration factor. We're using that far field stress. So regardless of how that crack grows, we're using the same maximum stress in the part. All we're doing is coming up with new stress intensities based on the shape and size of our crack. So once we have a maximum stress, we're going to continue to use that maximum stress in our calculations. And since we just found that the fast fracture doesn't occur for a crack of a certain size, but now we're going to say, okay, at what size will the crack actually cause fast fracture? Now, to do this, we're going to look at two different approaches. 
I used to give you guys three approaches. I'm going to break it down to two. This one we're going to call our approximate method, and the next one we're going to call our accurate method, okay? The approximate method we're going to use sometimes whenever I ask you for the approximate method and for other certain kind of times. And the average, the uh, more accurate method we're going to use at other times. Here's how it works. We're going to calculate our initial crack size like we did on the last slide. We're going to calculate the beta associated with that crack size. We're going to calculate what our max stress is. We already could have done that. And then we're going to calculate what fast, what final crack length this K1C beta and stress level all predict by plugging into this equation. This predicts an estimate for the final crack size. Now this is not the final crack size. It would be if beta is correct. But K1C is a material property. That's not changing. Your max stress is the stress on the far field. So that's not changing. But beta is a function of our crack size. So if beta, if the crack that we start with is different than the crack that we finish with, it's very possible or even probable that the beta is going to change between those and this will no longer be an accurate estimate. So we're going to use this to estimate our first estimate of the final crack size. Then we're going to go and recalculate the beta at that value. That's our final beta. Now in this case, this is the approximate method, so we're not going to try and get it perfectly right. What we're going to do is use this final beta associated with that approximate final crack length. We're going to use the initial beta, and what we're going to do is estimate the actual beta as the average of those two in this manner. Once we have that, we then can evaluate fast fracture by taking this. We've got our K1C, we've got our average beta, and our maximum stress level. Okay, so what this means is we calculated the final crack length based on our initial crack size and our initial beta. We then calculate the beta associated with that final crack length. We use the average of those two to come up with a new beta. We do one more step to calculate a final crack size using the average beta. And we're going to assume that that is valid. That sometimes will be accurate enough, other times it will be grossly wrong. Now our next idea is to look at how to evaluate final crack, the final crack length, right before fast fracture. We just learned an approximate method of doing that, and now we want to learn a more detailed and accurate method of doing that. What we're going to do is start as we did before. We need to find K1C from the material. We need to figure out what our initial crack parameter is. We need to calculate beta for that crack parameter. We also are going to have to figure out what our max gross stress is on the part. And then we can estimate the final crack size by using the beta that we started with and using a modify of our K1 equation, a modified version of our K1 equation like this. We had our K1 equation, which basically says beta times the max stress times the square root of pi A is the uh, K1, and if we plug in K1C for K1, we can write that equation this way. If we plug in the beta, this will tell you for this beta and for this stress what the final crack length would be. Now, the stress doesn't change, and K1C doesn't change, and pi certainly doesn't change, but beta is a function of the crack length, and that means that if our crack length that we calculate with this equation is very different from the crack length that we started with to calculate our beta, then this will be wrong. And so the trick here of figuring out an accurate estimate of the final crack length is to make sure that as we iterate for the solution, we don't move too far because every time we try and estimate what AF is, we're going to need to use uh, the best beta that we can. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to kind of sneak up on the bottom of the AF without leaping too far forward for fear that we might miss the actual value. So our approach will be like this. We calculate A of the material initially and its beta. We plug those in with the K1C to calculate our final crack size. What we're going to do is look at that and find out if it's different than our prior crack length. 
parameter. If it's roughly the same, then we're done and we've found the final crack length. However, if it's different, if our crack is much different in size, then what we want to do is come up with a new estimate for the crack length, but without changing our estimate too much. So we can increase it. So let's say, and I found that for small cracks, a factor of 10 is good. Let's say we started out with a crack length of 0 0.05 and, uh, and we calculate a new, uh, and we calculate our beta associated with that. We calculate a new crack length or a final crack length of something like 0.35. Well, that has gone, those are quite different numbers. So in, what we will do is assume that the crack is bigger than 0.05, but we aren't gonna increase it by more than a factor of about 10. So if we use 0.05 before, let's try using a crack length of uh, like 0.5. And, uh, or maybe even uh, in that particular case, maybe even a smaller number, let's just go up to 0.1. We plug that in, we calculate the beta, we calculate our AF, and say our final crack length that we calculate now is like 0.2. We say, okay, we're getting closer. So we might split the difference and calculate, increase or increase our crack length from 0.1 to 0.13 or something, and then go through the process again. So basically, as it says here, what we're gonna do is take our AF, we're gonna compare it to the prior A, and if it's not, uh, if it's, not the same, we will increase our estimate of AF, but not going all the way to the new value and not increasing it more than a factor of 10. Actually increasing by a factor of 10 is great if you start with an initial crack size of like 0 0.001 or something, then you go to 0 0.01, 0 0.1, and so on. But if you're already at 0.05, going all the way to 0.5 might be too far. It might be better to increase that from 0.05 to maybe a 0.07 or 0.1 rather than going to making too big of a change. That's how we do it, and we keep iterating until we find the final crack length. This approach will hone in on the uh, an accurate value of the final crack length. Now, when we get to actually growing cracks next lecture, we're going to find out that as we do that process, we're going to get the final crack length out of our procedure because eventually we will find that final crack length as we keep growing our crack and then looking at our K1 as it relates to K1C. But uh, another way of doing that is this iterative process, and I'm presenting that now because we haven't yet learned to grow our cracks, okay? With that said, uh, I think that finishes defining how to develop our crack. Uh, how to estimate our final crack size. And we are going to need this to, uh, for calculus and other kinds of solutions. Okay. The next idea is the critical force to fast fracture. We, sometimes we want to find out what is the stress level or the force that can be applied and uh, without fast fracture, the max value. In order to figure this out, we can come back to this equation for K1 which has beta, the gross stress, and the square root of pi a. Remembering this, we can actually just plug in K1c and solve for the uh, gross max stress that is, uh, will not exceed K1c. We do that by rewriting the equation like this. This is the maximum gross stress that will not exceed K1C for this crack parameter and beta. Once again, we need to be using the gross stress, which means we're using a gross area, which means we're using the, the cross section of the area without removing uh, any area of holes that might exist or the cracks or anything else. Okay, This will tell us the max stress, that, that uh, the stress at which we will have fast fracture, or we can modify this equation, plug in that gross area, and we can get the gross, uh, the max force where fast fracture occurs using this equation. Got it? That's how we do uh, evaluate the critical force to fast fracture. Now, another idea that we might uh, or will need to do when we're doing fracture mechanics is the residual strength check. Uh, this is also called the force to yield onset. And basically what this means is Having grown our crack and estimated what life this part is good for, 
we now need to go back and look, well, how much did the crack grow? And what is the net stress on the part? And how does that relate to the yield strength of the part? Now, once again, we saw we're using the growth stress for our fracture mechanics, our crack growth work. But when we're evaluating against yield, we need to use the net stress. So in order to do this, all we need to do is calculate our net area. And our net area must remove any features that remove area. For example, holes, the crack, and everything else. If we have a bar that's this wide and our crack, uh, let's say, two inches wide, and our crack grew to one and a quarter inches, then our area would be that two inches minus the one and a quarter inches times the thickness. That is the net area. We can calculate. Uh, we can do this check two ways. One, we can just multiply that net area by the FTY to calculate the force at which we get yield onset. Or we can calculate with well, the net stress based on that net area and evaluate that against FTY to get the margin of safety. You got that? That's how that works. Here's a little example. Let's say we have a part like this. This is the material. Here's our allowables. Endurance limit, blah, blah, blah. Do we need the endurance for limit if we're doing fracture mechanics? No, that's for fatigue analysis. We're doing fracture mechanics. We don't need that. We do need the K1C, which we see here. This looks like an edge crack, so we can go and find which curve applies. And what we're looking for here is the minimum force that will precipitate uncontrollable crack growth and the min force that will cause material to yield. Okay. We can do that like this where we first find our curve, we then go and calculate our area. We calculate, remember this is not the net area, but the gross area since we're talking about uh, fracture mechanics. We can calculate our little parameters, read the curve to get our beta or plug into our equation. We then can calculate what the uh, these two equations apply. And so we can grab our K1C for the material and calculate the force, the critical force at which uh, we're right on the edge of fast fracture, okay? And then if we want to know what the min yield to cause the material to yield, we just plug into our second equation that gives that value. Does that make sense? You see how that works? Okay, let's look at a couple conceptual questions. How do we idealize this part? Looks pretty clear. Looks like 2B is just, or excuse me, B is just H. It looks like B is actually the H dimension, the distance dimension, and L is the total length. I'm going to look at my handbook since this slide is a little unclear. So we've got H, the parameter H is on the side of the curve, so H looks like it's B. Our B is the figure's H, and B is the width of the plate, so our H is that B. So notice I'm using nomenclature to find the part, but we need to convert that nomenclature to what do we find in the figures that we're using, okay? Our crack length looks like it's A is equal to W. Our force is central, so our stress is just P over A, where A is just H times the thickness, right? How about this guy here, if we have this little part? Now, there's two ways we can do this. We can do it on a flange-wise basis. If I say calculate this on a flange-wise basis, we can calculate what the stress is in this flange and just pretend this flange is the only thing there is. In that case, the B in the figure will just be this dimension 1.1. Or if this, if this part is in bending, then I, that's actually a really good approximation. If this part is in tension, though, then all the stress on it is the same and our B dimension that we need might be 1.1 plus 4.5 plus 1.1 minus the thickness, because actually it's going to be 1.1 minus half the thickness plus 4.5 minus the full thickness plus 1.1 minus the half thickness. So we assume that that whole part is effective and then calculate that width. So this is the way we're going to do this. We have a little part like this. This is similar to the homework. We can either assume that the flange is effective, which means 0.75 minus 0.03 is our flange width. This is appropriate if we have bending and the max tension is on that flange. Or we can assume that the whole part is effective, in which case we'd take 0.75 minus 0.03, 0.75 
plus 1.125 plus 1.25 minus 0 0.03 minus 0 0.03 plus 1.125 plus 0.75 minus 0.03. If we assume that's the total length, plug that in as our B, that would be appropriate for like an axial kind of load. So make sure you practice that, study it out. If you have any questions, log into the Zoom session. Let's talk about it. Enjoy.